Welcome to this workshop on getting the most from your Freestyle Libra. The materials we're going to cover here apply equally to all types of continuous glucose monitoring system. My name is Paul Coker and I'm going to be your host tonight and I'm delighted to introduce an expert panel. So we have Dr Emma Wilmot, we have Professor Pratik Chowdhury and we have Professor Partha Carr. The workshop goes on for about 45 minutes and is just packed with loads of value. I hope that you find it useful and that you enjoy it. Um, my name is Emma Wilmot and I'm a consultant diabetologist in Derby um, and I mainly do type 1 diabetes. I do four type 1 diabetes clinics a week um, and I'm the founder of the Diabetes Technology Network UK which sort of promotes access to technology for people living with diabetes. Uh, Pratik now cheers which might be a nice introduction to Pratik to introduce himself. Hi, thanks, Emma. Yeah, so, I've, uh, so I'm Pratik Chowdhury. I'm a consultant in type, one uh, in type 1 diabetes. I worked almost exclusively in type 1 diabetes for the last 20 years. I used to be in London at King's and I've recently moved to Leicester about a year ago. And I'm an academic, which means I spend half my time doing research, running studies, mainly around new technology or in particular around hypoglycemia. My pastime is making people, taking people down to 2.5 millimoles per litre in an MRI scanner to see what happens to their brains. Uh, and in my spare time, I uh, try and run the DTN with Emma. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay, so for those that, that are not familiar, the DTN is the Diabetes Technolo Technology Network. Thanks, Partha. Uh, th thanks, Pratik. I'm, uh, I'm committing crimes. So over to you, Partha. Yeah, hi, I'm Partha, um, a consultant in diabetes in Portsmouth. Thanks very much for the invite. I didn't know there was an option of not coming along, but uh, now that I knew, uh, but no, thanks very much for organizing it. Uh, always a pleasure. And uh, so, yeah, I'm a consultant, as I said, uh, that's my main job. And I also work as a national specialty advisor with NHS England, leading on technology, type 1 diabetes, etc. So uh, we, we've got a fantastic uh, panel here, and I have some questions for you. So the first question I have is, what have been the main benefits of Libra? and uh, path of why don't you tell us about what's going on in the national data so i can start off by telling you about so i mean we're speaking to people with diabetes here i think you know we're preaching to the converted you all understand what the benefits are and um, but from a you know clinician point of view we want to understand what are the hardcore outcomes when we look at clinical data so we've done a large audit across the uk of now about 15,000 users of the Freestyle Libre. And last year we published on the first follow-up data from over 3,000 of those people. And you won't be surprised by this, but it showed that you people's HbA1c reduced. There's a number of severe hypos where people needed help from somebody else to treat their hypos, they reduced. The number of hospitalizations that reduced, the number of diabetic ketoacidosis reduced. And most importantly, diabetes-related distress so feeling overwhelmed with your diabetes, feeling like you're failing with your diabetes, also improved over time. So really useful insight. And the reason we did that was we'd heard people like yourselves coming back to clinic telling us about the benefits. And we wanted to capture that in an academic way that made, you know, sort of policymakers and doctors across the country really understand what the benefits are. But Partha really has been the driving force in making sure it's got into the hands of people with diabetes. So I'll hand over to him to talk about the national data. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, I think for me, if you take a step back, uh, type 1 diabetes, I've always stuck to a principle that, you know, if you improve three things, you'll improve type 1 diabetes care, which is, you know, better self-management, better peer support and access to trained professionals. And I think in a one way, Libra does all three, you know, um, you know, people have always talked about when we had this journey, people talked about, well, where is the evidence? Where is the randomized control trial? Where is the improvement in HbA1c, which in fairness, it didn't have at that stage. But if you take a step back, it's fundamentally, it's an improvement of your quality of your life. There is not many people around the world who will turn around and say, do you know what I really, really fancy pricking my fingers if there was a choice? I mean, that is a crazy thought, right? So if you take it to that level, then it works because you know none of us as consultants would want if we had it in ms case herself uh, or you know if our children had it we would want them to be pricking their fingers that, that that's where it boss basically boils down to so do i think what we see and the national data we see it reflected all across the board i 
probably haven't seen the improvement of HbA1c that I've seen over the last two, three years as a collective in clinics that I have seen across the board. People are happier. It doesn't work for everybody. And I think that's an important thing to say is that, you know, uh, Libre is one part of the puzzle. But I think what I do see, and I think it's going to reflect in lots of the national data set, if you, if you improve somebody's quality of life, and I think the recent data that's come out from ABCD shows that people's diabetes distress is improved. Yeah. You live with type 1 diabetes, it's tough enough. Live with type 2 diabetes, is tough enough. You improve your quality of life, your diabetes care improves. I mean, it's not rocket science, really, is it? So that's what Libra does. So, and I think that's, uh, the, you know, and more, the more we can bring that sort of technology to people's lives, the better. So that would be my reflection. Thank you, Partha. And so what are the main benefits that you hear in clinic? I guess that's kind of a nice follow on from the quality of life. Yeah, so I pass, so I'll tell you what I find, and then I'll, I think I'll hand over to Pratik and Emma to give their views. Clinically, I always there are a few people who will say it didn't work for me. The majority of people feel it. The words you hear is transform my life. Suddenly, I can see what's happening. Uh, why didn't we have something like this before? Why did I have to go through hoops to get this? In general, the feedback has been very, very good, and I can only say that people who's Diabetes control has been very difficult to turn around due to many, many reasons. Um, they have done really well. They found it to be a godsend from that point of view. That's what I do see. Thank you. So, Emma, any reflections on that? I think the overwhelming message from people coming back to clinic is that this is absolutely life changing. You know, so many people say that, um, and you know that's what you know. I, I'm a diabetologist. I, the way I look at it, my job is to support people to improve their quality of life. I mean, part of I say this so many times. The whole point of diabetes care is to support people to improve their HbA1c and avoid complications. But why are we actually doing that? We do that because if you get complications of diabetes, it has a negative impact on your quality of life. But actually. If the care that we as clinicians and the demands that we put on you as individuals to manage your diabetes day in, day out, makes your life rubbish, we've completely lost the plot. What, what's the point in what we're doing? So for me, we need to get a balance between getting the best quality of life, you know, so you can manage your diabetes from day to day and life is good and also offset and reduce the risk of complications in the longer term. And I think that's where, what, that, where the role of diabetes technologies increasingly have. Thank you, Emma. If I can, if I can add maybe, and what I hear in clinic, I think in my head, I, I, I think people with diabetes, you know, look at their diabetes from their perspective. And of course, we have the advantage, if you like, of looking at across the board. And I think people in different places along their journey with diabetes might find different benefits. So some people who are, like, who are really close to the edge, who are working on really tight control, they want to um, know what's happening all the time. So they can be aggressive with what their dosing is, is, is doing and they can they can run tight and they get the awareness of hypoglycemia. They can see when they're dropping and they can take preventative action. You've got a, you've got a, a large group of people, you know, the UK average of A1C is about eight and a half percent or in the mid, um, what is that, in the mid late fifties, early sixties in, in, in new numbers. And we know that from that sort of place to get into the lower numbers, um, the most important value is knowing where you are and the number of values people look at because all the data says that the frequency of scanning maps to how well you go. And people who are on finger pricks might do, you know, the average finger pricks was two to three a day. There were a lot of people doing six and seven, but the average number of scans per day is about 14 uh, internationally. You know, the UK is slightly lower, about 12, and you look at the international data, but it's, so the more often you look at the sugars, the, the, the more, the earlier you find the high numbers and the earlier you, you head off the lows. And it's that that narrows the, the thing down and brings a time range. So for a lot of people who are in that middle chunk, that's what's happening. And then for a lot of people who are running really high, who are struggling with diabetes, one of the key things is seeing what's happening and, and kind of not wanting to do it. And, and some of those people might occasionally struggle with Libra, but again, it just helps them. It helps us help them. And I want to make a point about one of the things during COVID that's really transformed the way clinicians work is we've been able to look at people on Libre and, and we've been able to talk about real data. So for years, you know, you might have had the experience, people on the call of going to the clinic and the doctor saying, well, what's your blood sugar? You kind of, oh, between seven and nine or between 10 and 12. Uh, and I take so many units. And then we kind of make these, oh, well, put your lunchtime one by one or 
because we never really had that full complete data set. So actually Libra has transformed not just your lives, but also the, the, the quality of advice that we've been able to give to people as well. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I guess the counteraction of that is what are the benefits and challenges that you see in clinic of the use of Libra or CGMS? I can open up with that. So um, I guess one of the things relevant to the Freestyle Libre 2, which has just come out, is alarm fatigue. So that's a fairly new thing. I guess not everybody on the call necessarily be on Freestyle Libre 2, um, but as clinicians with experience with real-time CGM, you know, alarms are great to let you know if you're high or you're low, but actually they can also be a pain in the backside if they're going off all the time and it's alerting you to something that's not actionable. Um, so I think having alarms that you find work for you as an individual, and you know, very much would be keen for you guys to be in charge of what works for you rather than having clinicians set it. We might suggest a starting point, but it's ultimately about what works for you. I think the other thing that I feel that some people um, worry a lot about is the discrepancy between the Libre and blood. Um, and, I, and that's a tricky one because actually, even if it's off a bit, as Pratik was mentioning, like you've got so much data there and seeing the direction of change in things is almost more important than whether it's out one or two millimoles per litre. But some people get so worried about that that they actually stop using it, uh, which can be a shame because the other thing we need to think about is if you look at all the blood glucose meters that are out there, most of them are actually less accurate than the Freestyle Libre. So you also need to think about what you're comparing it to, making sure you've got a really accurate meter. Um, and that's why they suggest using the Abbott meter rather than uh, one of the sort of cheaper ones that, that you can sometimes get asked to use instead. I think there's probably another element to add in there as well, Emma, and, and it's not just how accurate the meter is, it's also how accurate and good your own blood glucose testing technique is. Yeah. How many people actually wash their hands before they prick their fingers? Uh, a lot of people <laughs> forget, there's a lot of smiles there, see. Yeah, exactly. It's very, very true. And also, you know, in periods of rapid change, if you're rapidly going up or rapidly going down, you're never going to get those two numbers, um, as, you know, being exactly the same. It's just trying to bear that in mind. Uh, um, I think the accuracy story Emma, is, is really key, isn't it? Because it, people, a lot of people, and in a simple terms, if you feel low when your sensor doesn't tell you, you treat the way you feel on the whole. And if you're seeing it's coming down, a simple... Uh, rule of thumb that I often use in my clinic is that we know there's a delay, particularly if you're dropping rapidly, that the sensor will read, might read a bit off. And often people say, well, the sensor missed my hyper because um, I was five and the and I was three, but the sensor said I was five. So if you've got a down arrow, I would always say your real blood sugar could be anything between one or two lower than what the sensor is reading. And if you've got an oblique arrow, it might be about one lower. If you've got two arrows, or straight down, your real glucose could be too lower. And that's why we always, in our DTN advice, we say, if you're below six and dropping, you have with single arrow, one jelly baby, double arrow, two jelly baby. So you take that margin out of it. The other bit is that when it says you're low and you're not, which actually overnight is quite common. And, and you know, I don't have diabetes. I've worn a number of Libre sensors over the time and I've run down to 2.8, 2.7 on the Libre. And I think the really important point is that we don't really know what low sensor glucose overnight that is asymptomatic means. There's two or three small studies which say that if you have a blinded sensor on and you wake up in the morning and if you didn't know you were low, actually people don't report quality of life or how they're feeling or headaches any different. So a low that wakes you up, of course, that has a negative impact. A really, really low one that lasts for a long time has a negative impact, but a lot of these soft lows, if you like, which the sensor says you, might, you wake up in the morning and it might have told you that you were low, but you didn't feel anything. Um, I, we don't think they're of any harm actually, because they happen so often. It's one in 10 nights, one in eight nights, if you look across the UK. And I think they cause a lot more anxiety than, than actual hypoglycemic harm. So it, it's, a narrow, it's a narrow and tricky one to tread about being trying to reduce the overnight lows, but if, the, if you get one on the sensor, not being too alarmed or scared by it, because they, it could well be, you know, I'm sure Path and I will have those, you know, one night in seven. Thank you, Pratik. A any reflections on this one, Partha? No, I think they've covered most of the things. I mean, there's lots of questions which we can take, but I think in short, you know, 
you need we need to stop be careful that we don't fall into the trap that here is a device and it will solve your diabetes i think that's very important right you know uh we, you know as clinicians we need to do that as people living with diabetes i think it's important that you have the, it's a bit like you know you, you get a new car you need to know how the manuals and how to drive it and how it's going to help your life so i think those bits are all important as part of it and i think that's where peer support groups can be so powerful you know you you can you can share the data and sort of pick tips as you go along so that's the power of it i would say so yeah so speaking personally uh, for for people watching that may not know this i'm doing a master's degree in diabetes practice at swansea university and earlier this year i had a residential where uh, partha emma and pratik each did a day on that residential and we were talking a lot about the use of CGMS and Libra. And I've been using CGMS in one way, shape or form since 2011. And I was just astonished by how complacent I was about my own data. I, I thought that I knew how to interpret it. And with the material that you presented on that course, it made me go back and reevaluate what I thought I knew against what you guys know. And it just changed the way in which I manage my diabetes massively. So I think that can be really quite important for those that have been using CGMS for some time. You know, it's worth asking yourself the question, perhaps, and even asking your clinicians, am I getting the most out of the data that I've got in front of me? And hopefully to add that, Paul, a lot of the stuff we talked about with Emma and I and, and Partha, um, you know, it would be great to post a, a link to the DTN um, uh, um, you know videos where we talk a lot about this this uh, about those things that we talked about uh, you know and there's some really simple rules that help you get the most of the data there's a couple that i i'm sure emma has her own tricks and part has her, his own tricks but there's a couple of ones that we use a lot which is you know when you're looking at the the way people talk about your target range of being 70 percent time in range actually to my mind what that means is that your allowance to be over 10 is 30 percent of the day which is eight hours and I find when I say that in clinic, you know, because when you see that trace going up and you see it over 10, it can, you know, it can generate anxiety. You know, it, you're being judged by that line every minute of the day and kind of relaxing saying the main problem is that novo sluggish and humor slug are so damn slow that once you've made your action, it's going to be two or three hours till it comes down. It doesn't matter because people have had 70 years of diabetes without complications. Uh, and, you know, we, I can see some of them on the screen here. Um, the data tell us that 70% time in range is okay to have a lifetime without major complications. So you've got that allowance and you've got to give yourself that uh, room, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the nervous sluggish or humor slug to work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing. I love your names for the, for the uh, so-called fast acting insulins. Yeah. yeah nervous slightly less sluggish. It's slightly better. But um, it's still it's still gone sluggish, you know. And then you've got we have I have different rules about your one hour sugar tells you about whether you injected early enough or not. Your two hour sugar tells you whether you've injected enough or not. And then the three hour sugar um, often tells you are you stressed, have you been sedentary or active, or have you got fat and protein on it. So there's these things on the on the DTN website that tell you what the same number at different times post meal has different value different actions that you that you you act on them and then finally there's something that i use i don't know if, if you've heard it i, I say to people the, the the sweet spot is about 10 scans a day because you want to be doing scan inject eat forget for two hours and then repeat and the way you know a lot of people scan a lot and you see lots of scans and close together particularly post me when they're high or alerts and actually uh, as emma said earlier if you're not going to act on that result then why try, get on with your life diabetes takes up so much time of your life as it does anyway um and instead of thinking about it all the time you you focus your your activity on the times when that scan yields some action pre-meal judge what you're going to do um a couple of hours later just check are you in range if you're dripping too quickly you can head it off if you're a bit high you can think about what you need to do uh, and then so it's about every two hours you want to you want to check and have a look and those are some of the quick tricks i've got emma i'm sure you've got some more and better ones yeah no, i was just going to pick up on the whole thing about scanning frequency you know and i think in an ideal world you would just you know scan inject eat and life would be that straightforward but as everyone on this call knows there are no two days that are the same with type 1 diabetes and you might think that what you're doing will go according to plan 
but there's huge variability and you know people end up scanning a lot because they don't know what on earth is coming next you know from hour to hour day to day and i think that's the beauty of the libre being able to dip in and just reassure yourself that things are okay and you know i've had some people in my clinic that maybe scan 80 times a day or more and I, and you think oh my goodness that's a lot but actually it, you know, some people get anxious about looking at the data, but actually a lot of people just say, you know, during lockdown, I've been sat at home. I just quite like checking in and making sure everything's OK and they find it reassuring. So I, I, I don't think we can be judgmental about what the number of scans per day means, because actually everybody's trying to get to the same output, which is more time and range and good quality of life. And I think everybody's got slightly different ways of achieving that. And uh, what about the use of uh, time in range, the, the GMI difference to the real HbA1c? What, what's most important? Uh, I absolutely love time in range. Oh, my goodness. With that, we used to have conversations in clinic about trying to get HbA1c's down. What on earth does that mean? A t trying to a, a sort a blood test that you have no control over and it's just going to spit out whatever number it spits out. And I think what we're starting to understand is that actually in some people it's a rubbish marker of glucose control. So people get worried if the HbA1c is not the same as what the Libre expects your um, glucose to be, your HbA1c to be. But actually HbA1c is basically a measure of how much glucose is stuck onto the red blood cells in your body. And we use that because we had no other way of looking at glucose control over a long period. We now have Libre and continuous glucose monitoring that can directly measure glucose so I would be more focused on what your glucose is on your Libre or your CGM than some blood test that your doctor's doing. And I'm a doctor saying that. Um, and also time and range is more meaningful day in, day out. You can keep an eye on it. You can see how things are going from day to day, week to week, month to month, rather than this horrible blood test that your doctor makes you get done every so often. You know, I, I love that answer, Emma. And one of the reasons that I love it is that for many years, I've been working really, really hard between clinic appointments. And I think, yes, I've really got this nailed. And I'd go along to the clinic appointment, my A1C had gone up, not down. And I, I just had no way of actually analysing what that metric was going to be between appointments. And it can get very demotivating, or it did for me at least. And then just to point out when there's a difference between your, so we know, so there's a couple of things. The first thing is that often when you look at your estimated A1C on your Libre view, right, you, that's over a two week period. And we know that, you know, you can have a two weeks when things are really good, then you go on, then something else happens, then you have a couple of weeks period. And actually everyone's control kind of bounces up and down a little bit. And, and, and kind of a, a couple of weeks period is what you need to see what your overall picture. So that's one of the reasons why your A1C is always different from the estimated A1C on the Libre because they're looking at different times. Your A1C is looking at three months, your estimated A1C at, at two weeks. The other thing is we know that for some people with the same even, the estimated A1C comes off a, a calculation and it, it's an average. So we know that for any A1C, your estimated A1C could be about 1% either side. Okay. But ultimately what you're going to work towards is your time and range. So and the way I look at it is that for some people who've got a, a low A1C, but the time and range isn't great, fantastic. We know that complications are linked to A1C, so that's good on you. If you've got a very good time and range, but your A1C is high, and we call that high glycosylators, for some reason that A1C just runs higher, look, you can't drop your glucose any lower. You've already got 65 70% time and range. So in that scenario, if the A1C is high, it might mean you've got some high risk, but you can always address those with cholesterol or blood pressure medication. There are other ways to drop your risk of complications, but you can't push your glucose any, any lower. So that kind of time and range or estimated A1C, when you're treating the glucose, that's, that's the outcome that, that really matters. Okay, thank you, Pratik. A any thoughts, Partha? No, I mean, I think, has, you know, they've articulated pretty much everything what I talk about, time in range. And I think, you know, you see people and we, we put too much pressure. I think there's a lot of conversation. If you ask most of the people that come to clinic and you say, so what do you think your level should be? It goes, ah, oh, four to seven. And you go like, okay, how far do you think it should be between four to seven? And they go like, what do you mean? I said, well, how, how much should it be between four to seven? And they go like, oh, all the time? And then the next thing you go like, well, nobody humanly can do that. So what do you want to do? And I think that's always, always a big light bulb moment. People, people go like, what? so that's not what I want need to do. The pressure on people that we put because of that is phenomenal. Because I think then when you say, look, 
if you look at me, I can't get it between four and 10 all the time. And I don't even have type one diabetes. I'm supposed to have a fully functioning pancreas. So the best technology in the world, let's say I give every one of you an artificial pancreas, aka the hybrid closed loop, you still won't get to 100%. So why are you trying to do it with insulin from outside? And I think, I think those conversations are quite important because as Pratik has put in the chat, when you talk about, look, hey, listen, and Pratika said 60%, I, I start with 50. And I went like, hey, listen, you get a 50. That's amazing. Four to 10, 50. Let's go with that. And, you know, we see people coming with an H, uh, whatever HB1C, time and range, 20%. Any, so I think it's about how you put it across because my approach is, hey, listen, let's catch up again in four weeks. Let's get you to 25. Let's do it slowly. What's the rush? You know, then we get a 30. And I think, you know, when people then come back and invariably, because you've given them some tips, it's not 25, there are 31 and he's delighted. And you go like, wow, you know, you've done, wow, this is amazing what you've done. Let's, let's now take it to 35. So I think support. And I think people need to, we don't do that enough. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the fundamental problems that we have in this country. So um, but we're we getting there. I think there's a lot of good people, a lot of clinicians starting to understand the concept. We talk about language matters. This is all intertwined with each other. Right. Uh, so don't try and do, don't don't try and judge people whose lives you don't live. That's, that's my simple way I say, you know, forget about type 1 diabetes for a minute or type 2 diabetes. Forget about that bit. You just don't live their lives. So you don't know what mental things are going on, you know, whether they have to think about the cooking they have to do or the shopping they have to do or mental issues going on. Can't judge them. Which is why I set very small targets for everybody I see. I always go 5%. Let's do 5%. And they invariably come back with higher. So it's about how you have those communications, I suspect. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really good because when I first got a CGMS back in 2010, you know, I was doing this independently. I didn't have any clinical support for doing it. And I saw my numbers and I went, I'm going to be really aggressive about bringing my timing range up. And before I knew it, I was in the clinic with uh, being treated for retinopathy because, of course, I'd improved my diabetes control too quickly. So I think that it's really easy to look at these numbers and say, yeah, I'm going to get there and I'm going to do it really, really quickly. But there's probably a benefit in doing it in a more gradual and controlled method. It's 100%, isn't it? I mean, you take anything in life, you know, uh, you take the example of Pratik or Emma and me, you know, we were where we were about 10, 15 years ago, we were trainees, we were sitting around and we've all evolved, you know, we, and I'm, I'm not going to second judge them, but people don't see the failures, you know, I, 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 most of my projects actually don't work. Uh, people don't see that. People always see the good things. So, um, but you keep trying, you adapt, you amend, and that, that's how it is. So diabetes is going to be no different. And, you know, my dad's got type 2 diabetes. That's what I keep saying to him. So when he sort of, when we have a phone, he goes, like, can I have a mango? And he goes, like, yeah. Why can't you have, who told you can't have a mango? And he's 81. So you go, like, yeah, have your mango. Just, you know, just be careful about how many mangoes you end up eating. Because I know my dad. Just, just you know, but that's fine. You know, that's life, how it is. And, what you don't want to tell him is what is a failure, right? I think that's the important thing. And I, you know, Bernie has put a really good question. Are we too, are we too strict on ourselves? Are we unrealistic? The answer is yes. You know, and that's the expectation we set. Isn't it? Sometimes social media sets the expectation, isn't it? You look at social media and you go see these perfect graphs of people and you go like, okay, well, that's not happening for me. So what do I do? So I think it's about that. It's about I think empowering is, a, is the word I use rather than saying you have to be that. If all of us could run like Usain Bolt, there wouldn't be a Usain Bolt, would there? So it's one of those things. Thank you. And I think it brings us on nicely to the next question of how do you deal with the increased anxiety from scanning repeatedly? And Emma touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, I'll just start and then get the others. I, I basically tell people to take a break. I generally do. I said, take a break, take a pause. This is for you with your life. Two weeks, three weeks, fine. We'll chat again when you feel comfortable in that space. Switch off your alarms if you need to. Again, we talk about the time and range. We talk about what you're trying to achieve, quality of life. Uh, and I think it's about the end game. So I always say people have a lot of anxiety. It's about that whole expectation that's built, which causes the anxiety, isn't it? Because you're trying to get there. And I think we, you know, that's where we professionals have a role of supporting. And I think Pratik or Emma kind of said that in a talk, which was about we are guides. You know, that's all we do. We go like, here's the road. You know, that's, we can try and help you on it. So 
That's what I say. So anxiety is driven a lot by circumstances around you, what people are saying. And, you know, we saw that during COVID. What, what was the message? And we tried a lot to try and handle the message, which is about, the message was very binary, wasn't it? Which was, if you've got diabetes, you've got a high risk. If you've got poor control, you're pretty dead, right? And everybody's like, okay, this is a bit worrying. And you go like, no, it's still in context, still what we want to do. It's not as straightforward as that. So I think, you know, we, we all have a role. And I think peer support, I talked about peer support. Peer support have got a massive role here as well. You know, looking after each other. Don't put uh, extra pressure on people by saying that if you eat a cus- if you eat a custard cake, your foot's going to fall off tomorrow or things like that. You know, people need to relax those things. Thank you, Partha. Um, a- any thoughts on that, Emma or Pratik? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, and I guess this is really difficult, particularly for some individuals more than others, but do whatever you can to not have an emotional reaction to the number. Because you're all trying your best to do, to get where you want to, but don't, you know, because I've seen people start going, oh, I've scanned, I'm too scared to look at the number, and really it's going to stress me out if it's still high. You know, diabetes is a beast, an absolute beast and your job is to tame that beast but it will do whatever it likes despite how well you try and tame it and you know as we said earlier even the best technology the closed loops can't keep those numbers in control all the time so do not put pressure on yourself to be able to do it look at the patterns stand back learn think what can you do differently but do not beat yourself up for those individual high glucose you know the readings you don't want to see because that repeated feeling of failure, that repeated feeling of I'm not doing well enough is what eats away at you over time and destroys your your, your life living with diabetes. If you can find a way to be at one with your diabetes, uh, then you've arrived. Uh, yeah, thanks, Evan. And I, 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 if I can add just two small things. I was taught never to say the word test. And I know a lot of you will have grown up saying I'm going to test my glucose because when you measure your glucose, it's not the result of a test if you pass or fail. You can get whatever number you scan. Uh, even if you did everything right. The point of scanning or measuring your glucose is to decide what you're going to do in the next few hours. What action do you need to take any action or not? And so actually that subtle change of changing the word from test to measure uh, can, can, can have a difference for some people. Uh, and finally, of course, it's a, long, it's, a long, it's, it's a long game, isn't it? And that one reading of 24 has no impact on your life. It's about, it's, it's about zooming out. And when you've got this Libre telling you every minute, but if your time in range is, 55 or 60 percent you're in a safe zone you're going to be okay and those odd up and down will even out over time with all the times that you have put in range so and that's the message that we need to get out there i think that brings us quite nicely onto your golf model that i've heard you describe in the past <laughs> try changing the game Pratik, because apart from rich people in kind of london not many people play golf can you say something that other people play like games that like normally people from the deprived backgrounds can play i know you have london and now you're a professor in leicester what about things games that like ludo or things like that <laughs> Well, actually, Partha, uh, someone was talking about why don't we make it beach volleyball? It would visually much better. Um, but there we go. <laughs> I think. <laughs> but um, uh, so, so the, the, an idea, Paul is talking about a, a slide that I've got, and you'll, you'll see on the DTN website that I that came to me um, late at night in a bar somewhere after many, many drinks. But it kind of, it's the only time I've ever been close to golf, which is this video game in this Irish pub in Washington. Um, but um, apparently it struck me that when you tee off on the golf course, you know, the golfer chooses how hard to hit it, which direction based on the wind and the length and whatever you do it. And that's a bit like you counting your carbs and looking at glucose and choosing how much to take insulin. But even Tiger Woods, the best player we've had for a generation or whoever's your idol, never gets a hole in one every time. As long as you get it four hours later, somewhere between four and ten, half the time, it means your settings, your ratios, your basils are probably the right the correct and you know even if you hit the right shot something's going to happen between now and three hours maybe it's activity maybe it's you didn't finish your meal that's going to put you down to hypo and it'll be a bit crazy for a while it's not because you did something wrong it's because something happened and even if everything is right your carb ratios and carb counting is perfect you expect that one in three one in you know 30 to 40 percent of the time you're going to be over 10 a couple two to three hours later and you're you know, going to hit a birdie and you got is it birdie or eagle what do you call it when you have to hit an extra shot to get it onto the green so 
if you're getting it in range 50% of the time, that means one of the key things is because you're not quite, you know, it's 50% of the time, people keep changing their settings and you put your carb ratio up a bit and down a bit. You put your basal up a tiny squirt and down a tiny squirt and you end up going round and round in circles and you're reacting to things that are just different that day, you know, um, one day to the other. And, and so you've got to be a bit reactive, see the, measure the glucose and react to it. Um, this kind of mythical thing, oh, look at your data for a week and then you can adjust your ratios and you'll get everything perfect. It is um, bullshit. Turn on that. Uh, should we take some of the questions, Paul? Yeah. Uh, just, we, we go through them. Do you, do you want me to read them or are you? Uh... I, well, I've got it open. I can pick a few. I don't know whether Emma and Pratik wanted to pick a few. I'm going to pick one which is more about uh, the type two beyond the type one, because I think that comes up a lot. So I think we, are, we, have, we talk a lot about type one. So. I think to all the people who are type two who are on insulin, I think you're absolutely right because there are lots of forms of type two diabetes and other types of diabetes which are very insulin dependent, right? And it's not different from that concept about having to procure fingers. So that is something we are certainly looking into. We are discussing with NICE and other bodies to see whether we can move into a space whereby we can expand uh, the use of any non-invasive glucose monitoring further. So that is something of work, which we're certainly looking into. Um, we started with type one simply because it was a smaller group and it was definitely people who needed their uh, sticks according to every type two, depends on the type or, or the journey you are in. Uh, and thereby it's about being the cost effective, but it's certainly on the radar and certainly something we're looking at. So that's something I wanted to pick up and answer because I know there's been a couple of questions on that. Thank you, yeah, and the other one that I've just picked up on is the discussion about what the target, the range for time and range should be. So in 2019, um, a bunch of experts in type 1 diabetes from across the globe uh, put together an international consensus on time and range, and they've set the range as 3.9 to 10. Um, so, you know, there are individuals that want to set their own personal range, but um, when we're talking about aiming for 70% time and range, and it's okay if you're above 50% time and range, we're talking about between 3.9 and 10. But the key thing as well about time and range, which I think has fundamentally changed how we approach diabetes management, is they also have a target for time below range, and they recommend that people should be less than 4% time below range. So it's worth just checking where you're at with that. Um, and the reason for that is we know that the more hypoglycemia you have, the higher the risk of having a nasty hypo where you might need help from somebody else, or in the longer term, the higher the risk of losing your awareness and your symptoms of hypoglycemia. So keeping an eye on it and trying to keep it less than 4% is, is really useful. I don't know if Pratik's a hypo expert, he might have more to say on that. Uh, and it's, it's linked to why is that 3.9 to 10 picked? And actually, it was some really complex maths about how you, they took data from studies that had both time and range in A1C. And we know that the A1C of 7% minimizing risk of complications that maps to 70 percent time between four and ten and then we also know that post meal go up to 10 for that initial one hour spike is within normal ranges so that's you know when you've for a long time we've said your pre-meal targets are four to six but we say that because we know that post meal the average rise after you've eaten is around about five five minimal so if you start your meal at an eight you, your average rise is about 13 for an average size meal to get up to 13 if you start at four so take that into account that's where that that number comes from and there was a lot of really complex maths that went into it so that it's not just something that you know clinicians dreamt up there was a lot of data behind it that says this is where the target should, should sit um, and for the hyperglycemia again i think there was less evidence we're just currently doing a study with 600 people across europe where we're giving blinded sensors to people who and we're, we're trying to work out you know because only half of the events you see on Libre, you would have felt if you didn't have the Libre. Now you see it, you know it, and you feel it, and you, you're aware of them. But actually, if you put a blinded sensor on people, they only pick up between 40 to 50% of those episodes. And what we don't know what is, do the other ones really matter if you didn't feel them? So a lot of these, and we also know, you know, we've been told four is a flaw with finger pricks, but actually you nothing, harmful happens until you get down below three for a reasonable time you might feel unwell but in terms of impact on the heart the brain or you know awareness or anything else 
um, that read that time between three and four is actually normal. A lot of non-diabetic people get down there without any negative impact. Um, the reason why we, we wanted we cut it at four is because we know the accuracy of these things isn't that great. But I, I wanted to make that point that the, the time between three and four, um, if you felt okay, probably isn't harmful, isn't worrying. It's the under threes for prolonged periods that is when your your brain function starts to slow down and it has an impact on the heart, you know, potentially. So those are the ones that we want to avoid. So that, that's just a kind of a, a comment about the lows. Thank you, Pratik. Uh, just, just reading through some of these uh, comments on here still. Uh, so uh, Victoria is saying, I'm type two on insulin with some form of genetic diabetes. I self-fund my Libra two. Will there be funding for patients like me in the UK in the future? Um, I think that's probably one for, for you, Partha. Yeah, the short answer is yes, because I think people, what we have done is that we have now devolved all the criteria down to the local systems. You know, uh, Emma, Pratik, they have all come up with criteria as to where they should be. And we expect all the local systems to have that discussion with their, you know, with their payers to say our job from the central was to embed it into the system, which we have. And now we would end, we are encouraging all the clinicians to have that conversation, saying if it works so well for people with type 1, why not wider? So I think it's starting to happen as well. Some areas is already starting where we are as well. So I think uh, that's going to be a work in progress, but no reason not to, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, Pratik's just sent me a message saying that he's got a dash. So I'd just like to say thank you, Pratik. Um, you added a lot of really great value tonight and it's been an honor to host you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, okay. what, have, what else have we got? Uh, somebody's asking how they'll be able to watch the, this latest. So it's being live streamed onto the YouTube, uh, not onto YouTube, sorry, onto the Freestyle Libra user group. So you'll be able to see it in there. Um, there was a comment on there about um, positive experiences from local peer support groups and again that's something I've put out to everybody so in Derby a couple of really uh, keen people approached us as clinicians and asked us if we'd support that so they set up their own independent Facebook page because um, it's difficult for clinicians to actively be in the page at the same time you know because it gets a bit tricky but so it's easier for it to be separate but they set it up and what we did was hand out cards in clinic so there's now 600 people with type 1 diabetes in derby that are on the same facebook page and it means that they've got you know before covid they were arranging get-togethers and um, you know but i've had people you know with um, sort of mental health issues saying it's been great to have a place to go that can feel safe to talk about their diabetes there was somebody with ketones in the middle of the night that's been able to get advice from other people you know when there's no other diabetes support services around. I mean, the guy that went to Wembley forgot his Novo Rapid pen and was able to post on the group and by magic somebody appeared with a spare pen for him. So lots of potential benefits from that peer support. And if you haven't got that locally, you know, if you and maybe another person you know with diabetes are brave enough to set that up and speak to your clinicians about supporting it, uh, I think there's definitely a huge role to play there. Partha, I know you, you're a big advocate of peer support as well. I don't know if you've got anything to say on that. Yeah, we're just about to launch a national program because the idea is that we want everywhere to have peer support groups. Uh, so we're working with uh, people who already are have created patient peer support groups as well as Diabetes UK, JDRF. So that's a big project we're going to start off on um, and uh, we shall see where it takes us because that's what I want to have, what Emma and others have to have that sort of approach everywhere in, in England at least. I think I've seen a couple of questions about uh, what hap what, what's going to happen with, um, for example, is the CGM in pregnancy going to Northern Ireland, etc. The short answer is uh, it's now NICE approved. And anybody who wants to, you know, we are starting the closed loop work or the artificial pancreas work as well. I, I have always said that my job title is NHS England. It's not NHS UK. But uh, the plans and the approach and what we have done is available to all the other countries, whoever wants to have it. So... We did that with Libra. So that's just one thing to mention. Somebody mentioned at the beginning about Meow Meow. I find it to be people who use it is not authorized. Uh, we can't officially recommend it, but 
I have no issues with it. If people, it's a bit like DIY. I always say that if it works for you, it works for you. But I think you need to understand that uh, unfortunately it's not something we can recommend because of our regulations as professionals, but we wouldn't stop it. We wouldn't take anybody off it. That's the way, you know, we look at it. Um, and Bernie asks, is it a, just with a Dexcom with closed loops? Well, at the moment, that's the only one which is available. So commercially, uh, I think Abbott, Libra are looking at it, but the Medtronic have got their own, which isn't a uh, Dexcom, that's their own as well. So you have all the options, commercial options, all of them will be on the table to be used as part of the trial. There, there was a basic question back in the beginning that I missed, and somebody had actually asked for clarification what CGMS was. Mm. Um, so Can we've answered that one. Yeah, so it's continuous glucose monitoring system. I think it's worth just pointing out that what we have with Libra at the moment is intermittently scans CGMS, and what you're talking about with Dexcom is real-time CGMS. And the two are very different, but Freestyle Libra is promising to close that gap. So have we got any clue of when Freestyle Libra might come along? Yeah, I mean, I had said earlier that I would like it to appear in this year. And I've said to the company very clearly, the door is open. They need to make their decision, but uh, there's no... There's definitely no obstruction from us. We are ready when the company is ready. So we are definitely pushing them. Um, and uh, my position or the negotiation position is that it should come this year um, because Libra 2 came at the beginning of this year, I think January. So hopefully by the end of this year, I would have thought. Thank you. There's a question here from, I think I'm saying this right, Tasing. Any tips for preventing false alarms from compression lows, uh, wearing the Freestyle Libra 2 in recommended areas back of arms? Mm, no specific tips other than, I guess everyone knows how they sleep and just trying to put it somewhere that's not going to get compressed if possible. But yeah, that is a tricky one. Yeah. When you find the answer to that one, let me know because it's not it's not just uh, freestyle Libra. I'm using Dexcom, and it happens there too. Uh, 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 I'm just scanning through, I'm not seeing any anything else. I think we're coming to a close on these questions. So, for me, any other sort of burning advice, simple tips that you might be able to give to people just to. You know, even if it's just talk to yourself more kindly about your diabetes or, or, um, or some reflection on, is it possible to get some traces up so they can share them in the group of people that don't have diabetes and are wearing a Libra or a CGMS so that people with diabetes can actually see what normal looks like? Because we've all been saying you're, not, you're never going to achieve 100% time in range. So what does normal look like? Yeah, I think there's some data out there on that one, as far as I'm aware, which, you know, uh, are available publicly to see. So, yeah, I mean, that sort of re makes the point that it's not always possible to do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah and just to say as well that both um, Pratima and myself have posted the link to the Diabetes Technology Network Libre modules, and I think you've posted it as well, Paul. So there's a range of modules on there. I know somebody's asked a question about exercise. That's a whole different, that's hours of talks <laughs> separately. But um, two of the top leading experts in exercise and type 1 diabetes have put together a sort of half hour module on exercise in the Libre. Uh, it provides some really practical, good advice about how what insulin to change and what considerations, depending on the type of exercise, et cetera. So that's available in the Diabetes Technology Network um, as well. Thank you, Emma. So uh, and unless there's any last minute burning questions, I'm going to wrap up there by saying thank you to Partha and thank you to Emma.